Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody, depending on where you're calling in from. Welcome to Why Social Media is a Must, Promoting Archery Well from World Archery. My name is Teresa Iacconi. Uh, I work with World Archery as well as USA Archery and the Archery Trade Association, generally working on social media and public relations for archery organizations. And so today we'd like to talk a little bit about why social media is important for our sport and how you as an athlete, coach, or a member of a federation, or perhaps even uh, somebody in charge of a federation, can help World Archery in doing more to promote the, and grow the sport of archery. So I think it's first most important to answer the question, you know, why is this important and how did archery become so popular? Um, the movie The Hunger Games, hopefully all of you have heard of it. it. Hopefully all of you have seen it. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to check the film out. The Hunger Games debuted in March of last year. And uh, here in the U.S., there was Hunger Games fever. Um, I know that in other countries as well, we read that globally the film had a, a very significant impact, at least on archery in the countries in which it was shown. And here in the United States, the book popularity, the, the three books had been very popular among young people. And so they equaled the largest non-sequel movie opening in history. Olympian uh, Katuna Lorig, who's a five-time Olympian and an Olympic medalist, Coach Jennifer Ro Jennifer Lawrence for her role of, of Katniss Everdeen. And you can see here the similarity between these two archers. I think that the reason the movie became so popular is that it really resonated with young people. Uh, the character of Katniss Everdeen with her bow and arrow uh, is a very independent woman and obviously uh, really demonstrated authenticity and made the sport of archery look cool and interesting to young people. So I think it's no surprise that it sparked a sudden resurgence of interest in archery. Many members of the media who have contacted uh, me uh, you know, to talk about archery or contacted the different organizations that I work with have asked the question, why this movie? Why not other movies like The Lord of the Rings or Robin Hood that, that featured archery? And I think the answer to that question is that Jennifer Lawrence uh, in her, sp specifically in this role, really projected, again, that authenticity. She was a down-to-earth character. She was real. And so whatever, whatever questions you may have around the fiction of the story itself, the, the character really, uh, I think young people related to this character and, and in turn then related to the sport that the character did, which was archery. So what happened? Well, these movie fans became archers. Young people across the world became inspired to start shooting. Uh, all, almost every federation that I've spoken to, and that doesn't mean every federation worldwide, but the federations with whom I've spoken have reported serious gains in membership, which is a wonderful story. USA Archery, as an example, their membership rose uh, by, from what I understand, over 25% individually. That's a lot of new members. The number of youth clubs grew as well. And archery manufacturers and shops have struggled to keep equipment in stock, at least in the United States. There's been a massive back order situation across the board with archery equipment, which I think is a wonderful thing to know because people are excited. Um, but it may, but it may also mean that uh, we need to step up our game a little bit as the archery industry on a whole and be more prepared for this sort of interest that's going to be happening. So what happened next? Well, Disney Pixar released Brave in June of 2012. And as you can see here, Princess Merida with her mop of curly red hair and her bow and arrow captured the hearts of people everywhere. Uh, Disney Pixar was wonderful to work with. They arranged an advanced screening of the film at the Archery World Cup in Ogden last year. And we had over 250 athletes and coaches laughing and cheering with the film. I think it's important to note for archers on this call or for people involved in the sport of archery that although everybody in the theater, I think many different teams speak many different languages and not all of them uh, spoke English, which was the film, the, the language that the film was, was broadcast in. I think it's important to note that everybody understood the universal language of archery. And so people were cheering and laughing and getting excited with the film and getting emotional at the more serious moments of the film. So I think it really 
hit the target in terms of reaching the archery audience. Also, for those involved in archery, you would have noticed that this film had a remarkable attention to technical detail. And I think that's important because, again, as I mentioned before, authenticity is important to the audience. And so with this audience of archers watching um, and seeing that the film portrayed archery accurately, the film gained credibility within our audience and I think beyond the archery audience as well. So now two big films within uh, four months of each other showing archery, as, you know, portrayed by the main character, also a female very evident that the sport is going to become more popular again. And what else happens? Films like The Avengers um, also appear, which featured archery very prominently. Archery had a huge pop culture moment this past year. Suddenly, archery is everywhere. Fashion designers such as Louis Vuitton, this is a picture of a Louis Vuitton store display. They actually did these displays all over the world. There were stores in Boston, London, and all over the world that, that featured this particular arrow display. And models have been walking the runway carrying simple wooden recurve bows. Uh, feathers, obviously, have had very significant prominence in fashion design over the past year, hair accessories and so forth. So... I think that what really has happened is now suddenly people who used to say, I don't know what archery is, or is that that thing that Robin Hood used to do? Now suddenly they recognize what archery is. Now suddenly archery means something to almost everybody. And so what happens? Now we're approaching summer of 2012. The world turns its eyes to London and obviously media coverage at this point is very, very significant. Um, I can't speak for other federations, but I can speak for the U.S. Federation, um, where we saw coverage in Time Magazine, Rolling Stone, The New York Times, The Today Show, almost every single major media outlet in the United States covered archery last year. And that's an important piece to note for this seminar, because you may be saying to yourself, well, why does all this matter about social media? And I can tell you that these are the reasons that social media is becoming so critical for our industry, for, for a, a sport that used to be considered very small, sort of minor, even a little archaic. Now, suddenly, this sport is in the spotlight. And so what do we need to do as a sport? We need to come together to help promote it the way other sports and athletes and federations are promoting themselves. So what's next? Well, you'll see the heading of this slide, which says Archers, the New Vampires. If, if any of you are familiar with the Twilight movie series, um, it was immensely popular here in the United States over the past several years. And so uh, it sparked this vampire craze in the United States among teenagers. I actually had a reporter from ABC National News call me in June. I was on the way home from covering an archery event and my phone rings and it's a reporter who I have been at the time begging to cover archery events. And suddenly she's calling me. And that was very typical of last summer. And so the first question she gives me is, so tell me, Teresa, is it true that archers are the new vampires? And I, I had to laugh because it's a reflection on archery's pop culture moment in the U.S. that it had suddenly eclipsed, no pun intended, the popularity of the Twilight films. I think that's a pretty, pretty impressive statistic if you're familiar with those films. Uh, basketball pro Kevin Durant, pictured here, is cited with a bow in hand. Jennifer Lawrence uh, has been interviewing almost nonstop for a year and a half now about how much she has enjoyed archery. She is in training again for the next film, which is due out in November of this year, the next Hunger Games installment. And she actually gave a, an interview just this past month for Vanity Fair magazine, which will be out in a couple of weeks. And she actually talks about how she's been carrying her bow and arrows around with her, keeping them in her car and practicing very frequently. So it's great to see that that celebrities are also endorsing this. In fact, uh, basketball player LeBron James was tweeting last summer about how he was reading the Hunger Games books and getting excited about archery. So I think it's important to know that with top archers in the spotlight, uh, such as, you know, archers all over the world prior to London, Olympians from all over the globe were getting a lot more media attention as a result of these films because reporters were more interested 
in the trending topic of archery. In other words, archery becomes trendy because of the films. Reporters see a trend and get interested and start writing about it. London is getting close, and so reporters see the connection between London and the films, and suddenly you just have this perfect storm for archery. And so we had lots of increased coverage and attention on our sport headed into London. And so what happened? Archery became the Olympic Games breakout sport. This is a, such a terrific thing uh, for, I think, all of us to know. It was referred to um, in, in post-games coverage as the new curling. If, if many of you will remember that curling a, a couple of years ago was the Winter Olympics breakout sport. All of a sudden, everybody loved curling. I could see why I had an opportunity to try it. Um, at the end of, of 2011, and it was actually a great deal of fun. Well, I think archery relates very well to that analogy, which is that it's a sport that you'd look at it and you might think either, oh, that's way too hard, or, oh, I can do that. That's easy. But suddenly people pick up a bow and become really excited about what they can do with a bow and arrow in their hand and the confidence that archery can bring to them. So this is a photo that I took from my cell phone uh, camera during the during London, I was the press officer for the U.S. Olympic archery team and also uh, assisting world archery with social media in London. And we had over 500 members of the media show up to cover the first day of archery in London. That's an amazing thing to see. So what you're looking at in this photograph is the what we call the mix zone, which is the area that the International Olympic Committee or the IOC requires every athlete to pass through when exiting the field of competition. And so to give you some perspective, I took this photo from approximately 75 to 78 meters back from the end of the field. So basically this mix zone extended almost 75 meters down the field, and it was approximately, I would say, seven to eight yards wide. And so you are seeing, excuse me, seven to eight meters wide. And so what you are literally seeing as you look at this is hundreds upon hundreds of journalists, photographers, videographers looking at archers and photographing them while they compete on the first day during the ranking round. And so archery becomes suddenly the most watched sport in the United States, at least in the U.S., during the first week of Olympic Games coverage. NBC, uh, which is our one of our large broadcasters here in the States, reported that even more so than men's basketball, archery was the most popular sport. And in the U.S., certainly basketball is one of our considered a national sport, very, very popular. So it was amazing to see the tiny, relatively tiny sport of archery garner this much attention. And um, as anybody else who was in London in the press area can attest to, suddenly reporters from all over the world saw that archery was the hot story. If you recall, there were several great storylines that came out of the, the ranking round. Um, you know, the world record set by the, the Korean team and the United States women who, know, you know, a lot of folks didn't necessarily expect great things from, you know, qualifying very high in, in the qualification and the U.S. men not doing as well and, and other archers doing very well individually. So there were a lot of great storylines and this time the media was ready to cover them. So then we move to the Paralympic Games, and we have these amazing inspirational archers who have overcome these huge obstacles in life to compete in archery and win medals doing it. And here you have a screenshot uh, from a Samsung commercial, um, the theme of which was sport is for everyone. And here's Jeff Fabry, who shoots, as many of you may know, he shoots with a mouth tab. He was the um, one of the Paralympic gold medalists uh, this year for London, or excuse me, this past year in London. And companies like BP and Samsung did an amazing job of putting Paralympic archery in the spotlight. They did a lot of advertising using uh, Paralympic archers specifically. I know there were other companies and other countries that, that did so as well. And we were very fortunate to see this publicity for archery because it simply continued that trend that was started by the Hunger Games, started by the movie Brave and movies like The Avengers, and continued this wave of popularity right through the summer. And so what's the legacy? Well, Archery's popularity in 2012 was enough that it made year-end media coverage here in the States. Uh, as, as the person who handles press for the U.S. Federation, I can tell you that I am still literally getting phone calls almost nonstop. And we are 
excuse me one second, guys. It lost our presentation there. Uh, it was significant enough to um, make our year-end coverage on CNN, The Today Show. I am still getting calls from Fox News. Uh, just this past week, iVillage.com, we are seeing some really significant gains. And I just saw a question come up from the French Federation uh, that, that not seeing um, huge media coverage there, I think, is what it was what the... Uh, person was saying. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep holding some of those comments and questions in queue. And then what I'd like to do as soon as I wrap these slides is get into a more interactive discussion with everybody about what you've seen in your countries and, and also obviously how we can start with some of the nuts and bolts of social media, which I'll get into in just a couple more slides. Um, but at any rate, so the legacy from 2012, World Archery went from just over 13,000 Facebook fans in June of last year to 56,000 in December. That's an incredible gain. On Twitter, um, World Archery broke 5,600 by year's end. Um, we recognize, I, I recognize at least that Twitter has not, you know, our, our Facebook following for World Archery is a very global one. We, we are picking up lots and lots of folks from everywhere. Twitter's popularity, I think it, it is it is certainly very popular in many countries across the world, but I think it's not as universally popular as Facebook. And that's why you see, if you're looking at it saying, well, why do they have so few Twitter followers and so many Facebook fans? I think that's part of the reason. Um, and, and to be honest, World Archery is now doing more and more live Twitter coverage from events. We did uh, Twitter coverage from the Paralympic Games, uh, a lot of Twitter coverage during the World Cup final. And we're going to continue that through actually starting with the indoor World Cup final in Vegas, uh, as well as some coverage of, of the event in Nimes this weekend. And so I think you will see more and more Twitter followers as we continue that live coverage of events, which is really, I think, what people get very excited about. Um, and then just yesterday, I could tell you by year's end, we were at about 15,000 followers or excuse me, subscribers on YouTube. Just yesterday, we broke 15,500, which is a great milestone. And so we're going to be looking to continue to increase those numbers in 2013 and push forward during what's going to be a very hot competition season. Just a note about this photograph that you're seeing. You may be wondering why we took a picture of shoes. Um, last year at one of the United States um, very large national qualifier tournaments, um, we, which is called the USAT Qualifier Series, we had the last tournament of the year, we had... Uh, registrations come in and we have cadets, juniors, and seniors compete at these USAC qualifier events. We actually saw an almost complete reversal in our registration numbers. In that tournament, instead of the adults being the largest group of competitors, the cadets were. It was the 15 to 17-year-old archers who uh, actually topped registrations and competed in massive numbers, especially girls. And so this picture is uh, shoes that were actually designed by one of the competitors. She painted them herself. And this was one of the most popular pictures that we posted on Facebook during that tournament. This picture, I think it had something like 300 likes on it, which is a high number for USA Archery to get. Uh, we have a, compared to World Archery, we've got a relatively low number of Facebook fans. I think we're at just around uh, 10,000 fans on Facebook. And so for us to see 300, 400 likes on a picture is a big deal. And these, these shoes captured the hearts of a number of people. It's a very endearing thing to see young people embracing their sport and wearing their love of archery with pride. Um, I don't know how many of you relate to this, but as an archer, you know, I was a competitive archer myself, not not nationally competitive, certainly, but but I had a lot of fun competing on first the compound and then the recurve for about 10 years. I am actually in my spare time and a level four archery coach now. And in all of the years that I've been involved in the sport, when somebody would ask me what I did for a living or what my sport was, and I'd say archery, I would get a couple of different reactions. They'd either look at me as if I were, you know, from another planet they would say, oh, like Robin Hood, or they might say to me, oh, I tried that sport years ago in camp, and I got a huge bruise on my arm from doing it. So for me, it was very exciting this past year. Personally, it was very gratifying that when I went somewhere or did something and somebody said to me, well, what sport do you do? Or 
what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I work in archery. Suddenly they got it right away. And they said, oh, my kids just tried that sport and they love it. Or, oh my goodness, I saw archery in the Olympic games. I don't know how I ever missed that sport before. Or, oh, I saw the Paralympics. Those archers are amazing. So archery is really becoming a very universal language in many, many parts of the world. Maybe not every part of the world, but many of us are starting to see these huge games. And I would love for more countries, more federations, more athletes to see some of those gains, but it really starts with each one of us. So embracing social media has become critical for our community. Archery is still appearing in films and television shows. Again, it's not standard across every country in the world, but it's certainly happening in some countries in the world. And I think all of us have a responsibility, whether archery is the most popular sport in our country or not. And I don't know that it's necessarily been the most popular sport in the United States. It's certainly much more popular. I know in other countries, it is the most popular sport. Wherever you fall in that spectrum, it, we, I think all of us have a duty to our, to our community, to our sport, to help promote it and help grow it within our country and across the world. Because truly with world archery, embracing social media as it has, suddenly we really have one voice as an archery community. And I think it's important to work together to promote the sport. So Hunger Games film sequels are arriving in November 2013, 2014, and 2015, at least in the United States. And it's important to note, if, if any of you have followed the books, the final book is being split into two movies so that there are three sequels coming. Um, different people have questioned whether archery will remain as as um, as key a role in the next few films as they did in the initial film. And my response to that is we know Jennifer Lawrence is training again. We know it plays at least a small part in the second book. And I can tell you that um, the movie producers did take some liberties from the first book. And given that this archery craze has happened, I don't think it's hard to imagine that archery will play a more significant role in the second film than perhaps we think it does based on the book. So I think it remains to be seen but whatever the case may be, it is uh, the, the character is an archer. And so whatever role archery plays in that film, I still think we're going to see a boost from it. Additionally, there are other films coming. The Avengers has a sequel in which archery is going to figure. Uh, Brave also has a sequel coming. Archery is being featured in the film The Hobbit, which is playing in the US right now and uh, expected to be released in other countries as well. And Epic the Movie, for any of you familiar with uh, that film, is scheduled to debut in May of this year in the United States. And this movie features archery very heavily. The main character is an archer. There are many archers in the movie. It's an animated film. It's more geared towards, uh, I would say, probably the, the 6 to 12-year-old set, similar to what Brave was. But again, a lot of adults are going to see it when they take their kids to the movies. And so I think what you're going to see is more and more people embracing the sport. We have a very hot competition season coming this year. Obviously, we are in the midst of the indoor uh, archery World Cups. We have the Archery World Cups, World Archery Championships, World Archery Youth Championships, and World Archery Para Championships. In addition to the World Games this year, uh, several world ranking events, some para events. So we've got a really big competition season coming and all of us have a unique opportunity to promote and grow the sport that we love. So why is it so important to have a positive social media image? Well, social media is really, it's almost at the point where it's no longer an option. Well, two, three, four years ago, when Facebook was not quite as popular, when Twitter was something we had barely heard of, it was optional to get involved in social media. If and I'm, I'm not talking so much about you personally. I'm thinking more of you as an athlete, as a federation, as an organization, uh, perhaps as a, an archery club or as a coach. It was optional. You didn't need to have a presence online. But the reality is now, and this, this is true especially for athletes and federations, um, without a credible, established, official page, fans will author their own. Great example, um, you know, as we as World Archery really started focusing heavily on Twitter this past summer, um, I got a, a direct message on Twitter from uh, Ida Roman from Mexico, the Olympic medalist, and she 
responded to me that uh, the page, one of the fan pages on Facebook that was promoting her was not her page. It was not an authorized page. And people were putting content on there that she wasn't authorizing. The reality is that anybody can create a Facebook page for anybody they want to create one for. And this is not necessarily a personal page we're talking about. This is a fan page. And so if you don't create, if you don't take charge of your own social media image, the reality is that especially if you're a popular athlete, a federation, or even a club, someone else will take it upon themselves to do that for you. And I think all of us would agree that you probably want to be the source of your own information. Journalists, sponsors, and even employers, uh, university admissions officers, use social media presence as a resource. They are looking for character information on you. They're looking to find out if you say, I'm an Olympian, or I'm an archery national champion, or I'm a professional archery coach. I can't tell you how many people are going to go straight to Facebook because they want to see what you have to say. They want to see the image you project. And the reality is that all of us leave some sort of a, once you get involved in social media, you're leaving some kind of a social media footprint. You're leaving something behind. And so we want what you leave behind to not only speak well of you, but to promote you because in turn, that gives World Archery content that we can share. It's a big part of what World Archery does in its social media strategy is to share posts, to share links, to share photos from athletes, federations, and clubs around the world. And so the more folks who are getting involved in social media and sharing that information out on a fan page, the more World Archery has that it can in turn promote to its 56,000 fans. So even if you're saying to yourself, well, I could put up a page, but I'll only get two or 300 likes. Rest assured that if you communicate your information back to World Archery, we're going to share it. If you send out a tweet and you tag us and it's an appropriate tweet, I'm going to retweet that on behalf of World Archery out to our 5,700 fans and I have, or 5,600 followers rather on Twitter. And I have to tell you that there are other new websites um, like archerytime.com, other federations, other athletes who see these tweets and see these posts and also share them as I'll show you in a moment. So your reach, if you are an archer or a club or a federation or an archery manufacturer, or you have a, a shop, whatever your role in archery, if you're putting positive information out on social media, know that it is being received and shared far beyond the audience that you have, because there is a much larger archery community out there who wants that information. And so others in the industry are going to share. Remember that a fan page is going to build authenticity, credibility, and good relationships with fans and sponsors. So if you're thinking about, well, how do I get a sponsor? You know, what do I want to project to my sponsors? The answer is that fan page is a really good start. Um, I will share one little anecdote with you before I get into the nuts and bolts of creating your Facebook page and, and some tips for making it really effective. I was at um, the USA Archery Coach Symposium and a team manager training this past weekend in Colorado Springs in the US. And while I was there, I was approached by a coach who is also the parent of uh, one of our athletes who lives at our Olympic training center. She's training for the 2016 games. She's training to make the 2016 team. And so he immediately approached me and said, Teresa, you know, my daughter um, is really interested in, in getting some sponsors. She's really interested in doing more media. Uh, she'd like to do some technical consulting. There are all these TV shows and films now showing archery. She'd like to do some technical consulting. How does she get started doing all of these things? What do my wife and I need to do to help her get some sponsors and build a name for herself? Do we need to go get her an agent? That was the first question. Should we get her an agent? And, you know, his daughter is ranked fifth in the country. She's a very, very good archer. She's an outstanding young woman. And my response to him was what I would prefer you do instead, because the reality is a sponsor is going to look at the amount of uh, money you can return to the company for their investment. In other words, if you're an athlete, you know by now that if I am, let's just ABC Bow Company, and I want to sponsor an athlete and I say, well, I'm going to spend 2000 US dollars to sponsor you this year. I'm doing that because I expect that you're, whether through your image or through 
uh, appearances on behalf of my company, you're going to sell at least $2,000 in product, if not more, by creating the impression that you use my product. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Well, what I said to this parent was that while it might be premature for his daughter you know, ranked fifth nationally, not much international experience at all. It might be premature for her to start seeking an agent and going after major sponsorships because the reality is she doesn't yet have the name recognition. But what that athlete should be doing and what each of you should be doing is now at, at this quiet time between Olympic Games, I say quiet time, it's really not quiet in archery right now, but this quiet time between Olympic Games now is the time to start building that social media fan base. Now is the time to start writing a blog or get posting videos on YouTube and sharing them through social media. Because the reality is in two years, in 2015, when companies, excuse me, when countries start conducting Olympic trials and companies start looking for archers to sponsor, they don't wanna see the archer who has no presence on Facebook, no presence on Twitter, or a brand new page that has five followers, they wanna see an archer who has market value. They wanna see uh, an archer or even a federation, and I say this because USA Archery obviously depends on sponsors as well. They wanna see a federation, a club, an athlete who has an established following, who has, I can't tell you how many times, um, even a journalist, when considering who to cover, they wanna know not just who's the popular athlete in the US, but who has a Facebook following? Who has a lot of fans? How many fans does Brady Ellison have? You know, How many Twitter followers does Jake Kaminsky have? Those are things that journalists and sponsors want to know. Social media establishes credibility. So how do you get started? Well, today we're gonna to explore, you know, there are obviously several social media outlets out there, right? There's Pinterest, Google+, you've got YouTube, Tumblr for photo blogging, Facebook, Twitter, but I think the two that I want to focus most heavily on right now and the two that are most well established and are continuing to be leaders in the social media area are Facebook and Twitter. And so I want to review those now. So if you have not signed up already for Facebook, understand that in, in one way or another, you have to join Facebook to create a page. Now, does it mean that you need to create a personal page and interact with Facebook personally if you don't want to? No. Um, but what we're talking about here is creating a fan page as opposed to a personal page. So the first recommendation I have for all of you, um, even ev everybody, USA Archery, World Archery, Brady Ellison, um, all um, a lot of the different athletes, I know Mariana Avitia, a lot of the different athletes or federations started on Facebook using a friends page and quickly discovered that this did not work for them because you have to approve every single friend request. And sooner or later, your audience becomes uh, so broad that you can't share anything that's really personal with just your friends and family. And you're never sharing anything personal with your friends or family because you're always talking to your fans. And so the number one recommendation I have for each of you on this webinar is to make sure that you set up a public page, which is what I'm going to teach you how to do now, as opposed to setting up a personal page. And this allows people to interact with you by clicking like on your page. And that allows them to get your updates and your photos as opposed to having to request you as a friend and wait for you to approve it. In other words, it's a different kind of a transaction. This also establishes credibility. When you put a page up as a, as a uh, business, as a public figure, as a business, as an organization, as a team, whatever category you choose, and I'll show you how to cho choose that category in a moment, you are saying that you are a, a more public entity and that builds credibility. So here you will see the initial getting started page. And here you are either going to have to log in first. Uh, this is if you wanna access your existing personal account. What I would do instead, if you wanna create a page, you can back out of the system. So you basically would log out of your Facebook if you're logged in. And what I'd love to see you do instead is now when you come to the sign up page, if you look way at the bottom here where I'm circling my mouse, it says create a page for a celebrity, band, or business. And that's what you're going to click is create a page. 
So now you're going to choose a page type. And this depends a little bit on whether you are a federation, a club, a team, or if you are an athlete. So if you're an athlete, you would go ahead and click artist band or public figure. And if you are a team or a federation or an archery shop, I would recommend clicking company organization or institution. Now this brings up one kind of important question. During the Olympic Games, I had a couple of coaches come to me and say, what should I do about Facebook? Should I create a fan page? Well, that depends on who you are as a coach. And I'm going to say this, and it's no disrespect to anybody whatsoever. I'm just being very honest about it. If as a, as a coach or a team manager, you have a very large following of people in your country, yes, I would recommend using a public page to communicate with people. If you are a coach and you run a coaching business, I would do that as well. I would create a public page where people can interact with you, find out about your coaching business, learn about the hours that you give lessons or where your club is located or any of those types of things. If you are not as much of a public figure, I, I would recommend probably staying with the friends model. Now, again, I'm, I'm going to be really definite and say that if you're an athlete, a federation, an established club, even if you're concerned that you're not going to have many likes or fans at first, you still need to go with that public page model because you're going to promote in a different way than a coach who um, you know, runs a very small coaching practice. So for example, if you have 10 or 20 private students at home, uh, maybe you've served as a, a coach on a couple of national teams, but you are not planning to do a lot of publicizing about your business then I think a personal page is okay for you. But I think that's the only circumstance under which an athlete coach, uh, or excuse me, a coach would want to do that. I think otherwise for athletes, um, coaches who run more of a business or make a bigger name for themselves or want to, uh, basically for anybody who wants to promote themselves heavily, you need to go to the public fan page model as opposed to the personal page. So Sign in or sign up. Once you have uh, on this page, I'll just go back really quickly. If you have selected artist band or public figure, a little drop down menu is going to happen. It's going to ask you to choose a category. Uh, you would choose sports, and then it's going to ask you to fill in your name. And you want to you fill in your name as you want it to appear on Facebook. So it's really important that if you're an athlete, you're not using nicknames. Make sure the name is is properly capitalized. If you're putting in the name of your club or business, be sure that you're you know, recognizing local business laws that may require you, for example, in the United States, if you're organized as a limited liability company, you're always required to put the letters LLC after your company name, otherwise it can leave you open to some legal liability. So whatever your country or, or county or city's laws are regarding how you position your business name, if you're a club or a federation or a business, please make sure that you do that under this company, organization, or institution uh, category. It's going to do the same thing. You'll see a drop-down menu appear. It'll ask you for your category. You'll fill in a name, and then you will continue. So now here at this next window, if you do not already have a Facebook account, you have to create one. Again, you don't have to do anything with it personally, but you do need to be a member of Facebook in order to have administration rights to a page. If you already have a Facebook account, you just click this little link here that says I already have one and it'll prompt you to log in. Um, so you'll need to put your email, give them a password if this is a new account. You will need to put in your date of birth. This is required because, and this is important for your athletes if you're mem a member of your federation or a coach and you're thinking of having all of your athletes put together Facebook pages, be aware that Facebook, at least in the United States, uh, young people must be at least 13 years old to use Facebook. So if you happen to have any young archers, uh, a parent, I believe, a parent may administer a fan page for them, okay? And it needs to be made clear that this is a fan page for uh, XYZ athlete managed by his or her parents. Um, once the athlete is of 13 years of age, they can administer their own page. So just a note if you're considering encouraging your athletes to, um, to use Facebook, which hopefully you are. Um, so now you're going to enter the words below, and this is just to make sure that you're really a person filling this out and you're not a um, computer filling this out. 
Um, and then you're going to click here that you've read and agreed to the terms and click sign up now. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, as you can see, I was creating a page called Joe Archery. And this goes back to what I said earlier, which is that if you, um, if you do not create your own page, this just shows you how easy it was. If Joe Archery was actually a three-time Olympian, two-time Olympic medalist, I could have created his Facebook page very easily last night as I was doing this. So this goes back to what I was saying about be the owner of your own information, because if you are an athlete or you are a federation and you don't create your own page, someone else is going to do it for you. So, and you want the information to be accurate. And as I explained before with, you know, the message that we received from Ida Roman, the information going up on that page about you, I certainly wouldn't trust that somebody else knows your information better than you do, because it may be that inaccurate information is getting out there. So now you're going to add a profile picture. Now, I would really recommend, just as you did taking some care with your name, and making sure that it's capitalized and spelled appropriately, no nicknames, make it easy for people. When you choose that page name, you wanna make it very clear and easy for people to find you because how they're going to find you is they're going in, the, in on Facebook, if you're familiar with it at the top, there's a search box and people are going to try to find you by the name that they most commonly know. So in other words, if, and I'll just use USA Archery as an example, if people were to type in USA Archery, they would find us. But if they were to type in US Archery, we would not come up. So it's very important that you use the name by which you are most correctly and commonly known and the name that you want people to know you by. If, we're, if USA Archery is trying to make sure they establish their brand as USA Archery and not US Archery, it's very important for USA Archery to be known by USA versus US. It seems like a small nitpicky detail, but it's going to be very important later on to your brand recognition because you wanna make sure that that's done right from the start. Well, the same thing goes for the profile picture. You really wanna choose a picture that is representative of the page that you're setting up. So if you're a club or a federation, that's where you wanna use your logo. And you wanna make sure that the logo is appropriately sized for a small, um, for a small block. Because if you notice, there are lots of examples out there of Facebook avatars or profile pictures where the logo is not sized correctly for Facebook, and as a result, it's somewhat distorted. So it's really important to take first take a moment and size that logo down. If you're not sure how to edit a photo or you don't have any photo editing software, no worries. Uh, head over to a website called PicMonkey.com. It's P-I-C monkey.com and it's a, a very robust free online photo editor. You can resize, you can edit, you can apply filters. It's absolutely fantastic. I use it all the time when I'm on the road and I can't stop to do something in Photoshop or Lightroom. I use PicMonkey and it's terrific um, and it's free. So get the right profile picture that projects the image that you want. If you're an athlete, obviously you should have either a really good headshot, meaning a picture of you facing the camera or a really good picture of you shooting your bow. Um, if you're a club or if you are a, a federation, I would highly recommend using your official logo as opposed to using a picture from the club. There's a place for you to put that later on. So you upload from a computer or you import from a website and then you're gonna click save photo. It's gonna take a moment and then it'll advance you to the next tab which allows you to tell Facebook about yourself. So here you're going to add a description and a website to improve the ranking of your page in search. In other words, what you wanna do is say here, if for example, you are an athlete, I would say uh, Teresa Iacone has participated in archery for 10 years, first as a compound, then as a recurve competitor. Uh, she is, in other words, I'm talking about myself in the third person because you want to establish that credibility. So, and you want to rank higher in search results. Think about it for a moment. If I fill this entire description in with I, I, I in the first person, then it doesn't, your name is not coming up in search results. So what you want to do instead is talk about yourself in the third person. Joe Archery is a three-time Olympian and two-time Olympic medalist for China. He, it, it can be found online at www.joearchery.cn um, or whatever the case may be. Um, so what you're going to do is the description goes here, 
The website goes down here. If you don't have a website, you can put in a Twitter page if you want to direct people to your Twitter feed, a Yelp link uh, if you're listed on Yelp as a business. Um, for example, if you're a federation, hopefully you do have a website, but know that you can use Facebook as your website. Um, you can link them to any other profile that you may have online, LinkedIn, uh, Archery Time, any of those. And then you want to say, will this page represent a real celebrity or a famous person? It's important to click yes. You save that information. Now you can skip all this, but why you would, I'm not really sure. You need to create your page at this point. So take the few minutes and do it. This whole process should really take you from start to finish, even for a first timer, it should take no more than 20 minutes to create and populate a Facebook page. That's a pretty small investment of time when you consider what it could bring you over the years in terms of membership, free advertising, uh, customer loyalty, sponsor loyalty, and credibility with the media. So now you're going to choose your Facebook web address. And this is the address that if you wanted to direct somebody to your Facebook page, they would find it this way. So facebook.com slash Joe Archery. You want to be as clear here as possible. If you start to add, um, you know, underscores or you start to add hyphens, you can do those things, but know that they may make it a little more difficult for somebody to just type in the URL and get straight to your Facebook page without having to log in and do a search. Now, the other possibility here is if you, for example, are Joe Archery, and there are three other Joe Archery pages out there, you can do something that's a unique identifier but still makes it easy for you to explain your page name or promote it to others. So if Joe Archery is a 2012 Olympian, you can say Joe Archery 2012, um, or you know Joe Archery Go for the Gold, or Joe Archery USA, whatever, but some distinguishing characteristic that makes it easy to find or easy to explain to others or direct people to, something that will build some brand recognition as opposed to Joe Archery underscore dollar sign 34521. And hopefully all of you kind of see the difference there and being a little funny about it. But it is really important that your web address is something clear and easy for people to find your page. Um, just one side note, this last enable ads tab, you're simply going to tell Facebook whether or not to um, enable ads and promoted advertising. This is where you can pay to give your your page better visibility. My recommendation is don't bother at first. And the reason I say that is with a little bit, with a very minimal time commitment on your behalf a day, you can get a lot of mileage out of a Facebook page without having to pay for others to promote it. Because the reality is once you have done your, completed your Facebook page, you want to let your federation know that you've done it. So for example, if you're on this webinar and you are an archery club in the States or an archery shop in the States or one of Team USA's athletes, simply reach out to USA Archery on Facebook and let us know that you've created a page. We're going to help promote it. Um, if you are, here's a much better billboard for you. If you are a, feder a federation, an athlete, a club, um, an organization, anywhere in the world, you fall under the World Archery umbrella as long as you are part of a World Archery you know, member federation. Send us a message on Facebook. Send, send an email to World Archery. We will promote it. And so between your hopefully your own federation or if you are the federation World Archery, between all the different ways to promote that page, know that you're going to get a lot of free promotion to the rest of the archery community without having to invest. Now, how do you get that promotion? Well, first you have to populate your page. And I apologize, I know some of this type is really small, but I just wanted to give you the anatomy of a Facebook page a little bit here. So what you're going to do is you're going to share something. It says here you have no, notif no new notifications, meaning nobody's interacting with you yet. You need to share something on your page. So here's where your notifications would be. If somebody likes a post, or they comment on something or they share something that you've posted, you're going to see that sort of uh, timeline right here. If you have received messages from people, you will receive them here. Uh, new likes, meaning people liking your page, will show up right here. Insights, which I'll show you in a moment, which track your metrics, meaning they show you your results, will show up here as a chart. 
And then here is a list of your, if you are already a member of Facebook, and I have to tell you that if you're already on Facebook, your job is a little bit easier. You will already have a Facebook group of personal friends who you can now encourage to like your page by clicking invite. Um, if you haven't already, you need to go back and add that profile picture. You can do it from right here. If you haven't already added information about yourself, you can do it right here. And then, then that information will show up in this block. John Archer is a six-time Olympian. He has won three Olympic gold medals in archery. He enjoys compound archery in his spare time. Uh, he is married and has three children and resides in France. Um, you can find out more about John Archer at www.johnarcher.fr. Um, so it's important to have that information here. Um, so what can you do? Well, you could start by adding photos, a status. Um, you can ask a question. Um, but first, what I would do before you do any of those things is especially if you are already on Facebook, like your own page, because the people you are already friends with are going to see that you've liked it and therefore they are going to like it. You can also add a cover photo right here by clicking add cover and then you can write something, meaning let's start um, and that cover photo, by the way, will fill this space. It'll be a pretty large photo. Then you can start by sharing information. Now you can to share a photo or video we all know you click this button if you if you're already on facebook and just as you would on your personal page you click this you select whether it's a single photo and you add a comment with it and click post you can add a an album with many photos you can add an event you can add a status well what works on facebook there are a few things that you can do that are going to get you much better traction on Facebook than just sharing a status. So yes, you can share a status that says it was a great day training, shot 190 arrows, you know, in the snow and driving rain. It was a, it was a tremendous day. I really pushed hard and I achieved my goals. Okay. That's very inspiring to your fans. No question. But what if you put this picture there with it? Well, now when I'm one of your fans and I remember how Facebook works, I'm scrolling through my news feed every day, right? I may have 200 friends, I may have 1,000 friends, I may be somewhere in the middle, but nonetheless, I'm seeing a lot of information when I log on to Facebook every day. There's a good chance I'm going to miss your status if it's just text. But if there's a photo to go along with it, now it gets some traction. So here, World Archery shared this photo of the Netherlands team. Uh, this is the para team training in the snow. Motivation and inspiration, para-archers from the Netherlands training in some very cold weather. 423 people liked this photo. 121 people shared it, meaning that they clicked on the share link here and shared it with others. And then we had 16 comments, obviously here, very strong men. Respect to all the para-archers, dedication, unbelievable, bravo. So it is amazing to see the reaction that we got to this. Now, if we had just posted para-archers from the Netherlands are training in the snow today. How many likes do you think we would have gotten? Most people, it's not that people wouldn't have liked the post or wouldn't have cared about it, it's that they never saw it because nothing grabbed their eye. This photo is very visually appealing. You've got bright colors against a very gray and white background. It pops out of the newsfeed and it's unusual and interesting. So this helped fans to train with you as an athlete. Whether you're the athlete or the federation or the club taking this picture, you are helping others to train with you. Share your members' achievements if you're a club or a federation, right? The, the Netherlands um, Federation shared this great photo of an 80-year-old honorary member of one of the oldest clubs shot a double Robin Hood a few days before. Um, and we always try to credit the person that shares the photo. Look. 520 likes and 123 shares. And this is not necessarily, I mean, we don't know who this gentleman is. He might have been a, an Olympian. He might never have gone to the Olympic Games. He might just be a, a random archer from a club practice, which is what I was told, I think, when they messaged us and sent us the photo that the case was. This is spectacular. This gentleman got was seen by tens of even the people that didn't necessarily like the photo but saw it anyway so many thousands of people saw this photo and then the 123 shares so not only did USA or excuse me did world archery share this with 55 or 56,000 fans but also 
um, 123 people shared it on their own timeline, which means that if you assume that each of those 123 people had 200 or 300 friends on top of all the people that saw the original post, you can imagine how viral this photo went. And this is an amazing sense of accomplishment for this gentleman, it's a, but it's also great recognition for the Federation because they were tagged here. You can see that that text is highlighted in blue. We tagged them here, which means this post also shows up on the Federation's wall as well. So I would recommend that when you are posting things on Facebook, also be sure to tag anybody who's involved. For example, if it's a photo, if you've taken a photo of you know, Deepika Kumari, tag her because it'll show up on her fan page. Also, obviously, you can send it directly to World Archery in a Facebook message, you can email it to us, or you can simply tag World Archery in the post and we'll see it that way as well. Visuals produce the best results. This is one of the most popular photos that we have shared. Um, and so uh, Karina Christensen, from Den I believe from Denmark, shared this photo. She actually shared it on Instagram, which is a great photo sharing platform that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Facebook and Twitter. And she said, here's how we do it Denmark style, negative six degrees and 70 meters. Um, that, that obviously makes her a pretty intense athlete. Um, her you know, target is covered in snow and she's obviously hitting the 10 ring at 70 meters. This is an amazing photo and people respect it. It's authentic, 920 likes. 362 shares. You can do the math yourself, but you can imagine how far this photo went on the internet. So sharing different content types. You can do a lot of different things. This is World Archery's page. This screenshot was just taken yesterday. This was a photo that we shared yesterday. Within just a few hours, we had 533 likes and 133 shares. Um, we did a challenge yesterday, and this is a great example of how effective Facebook is. We, Archery TV, which is our YouTube channel, had, has a huge collection of archery videos. We needed to get 40 more subscribers to hit 15,500. All we did was ask. Now, we only had 19 likes, so you might wonder if we reached our goal. We hit 15,500 within, I think, six hours of posting. So it's an amazing way to advertise to your other platforms. If you're on Twitter and you want to gain more Twitter followers, a great way to do that is to put a link on Facebook. Also, we link to content that's on worldarchery.org. So the athlete of the week here, you can see uh, Mauro Nespoli from Italy is, uh, we did a playlist for him because he's the athlete of the week. So there's a YouTube playlist. And we also wanted people to read the profile that we wrote for him as athlete of the week. So here's check out our playlist, watch the video, then read our write up. Now, in a situation like this, you may know that if you put a link on Facebook, Facebook right away puts this little, um, it shares the link with a little block that you'll see. So if you see an interesting article on archery, if you see something that your federation, if you're an athlete, you see something that one of your sponsors has done or a federation has done and you want to share it. All you have to do is when you're writing your post, when you're, when you're putting together a new post, you just type in the link or cut and paste the link and it. Facebook will populate this little box. Now, what if you want to link two different things? Well, you can link two different websites. Know that a preview will only show up for one. In this particular case, what we did, there's a YouTube playlist. And so I clicked share from YouTube. It generated this little block. And then I added the second link in my comment in my post itself. And I know that may sound confusing. So when we get to the questions at the end, I'll answer any questions you may have. But again, you can share a link. You can share a text post, but I recommend always accompanying it with a picture. You can share a photo album. You can share a video. Um, you can create a poll and ask a question of the day. Obviously, World Archery has been doing the Athlete of the Year polls. Um, so there are so many different things you can do with content. And then you can track your results. This was uh, a screenshot taken just yesterday. And this shows what World Archery has seen. Um, I think the date range for this was from, okay, so it's December 21st, uh, or maybe, excuse me, December 17th was where it started to January um, 15th, which was, I think, yesterday. So you can see that there, it was, activity was really high right before Christmas. It's kind of a little bit at a low over Christmas break. World Archery was closed. 
I was still doing some social media during the time, but we weren't doing a ton of it over the holidays. And then you can see we start to pick right back up. And these are where our big blips are right here where you see those purple uh, circles. So we are up. So just to show you our total likes yesterday, 57,359. We're up 0.29%. Know that as this number gets bigger and bigger, your gains are going to get smaller and smaller. Um, friends of fans. 24,627,249. And what that means is that is the number of people who see when other people that other people have liked World Archery. So those are, that's the potential number of people who could, and all of us have done it on Facebook, you look at a friend's profile and you're interested to see what their likes are. They see World Archery, they click like. Now we've reached one of these 24 million plus people. Uh, people talking about this. 5,101 people are mentioning World Archery in their posts, and that's up 125% from the week before. And our weekly total reach, and this means how, you know, the, the, the total number of people that we are getting is about 45,741, which is up 127%. Now, you may be saying, why are we reaching less than total number of likes? The answer is that Facebook, and this is why it's important to update your page consistently. You don't want to just put it up and then never update it because it's you may as well not put it up. Um, the weekly total reach is the number of people who, for example, we have put together, um, you know, we've, we've started with, um, let's say, a post and 500 people like the post and then 500 more people saw that those people like the post. That's, that's reflective of our total reach. It's important to note that Facebook does not show every single post. So it's important to note that um, not everything that you post is going to be shown. So in other words, you need to keep that page updated consistently. Okay, I didn't know that I shared that. By the way, I, I know that we're running over by about a minute and we are going to be running probably we we'll probably got, you know, maybe 10, 15 more minutes in this webinar and we are recording it, FYI. Okay, so I didn't know that I shared that. Here's the other side of social media. Hopefully all of you know that when you click on Facebook, comment or like on somebody else's picture, that shows up to everybody who is friends with you. So here are two very innocent examples. On the left side, uh, Thomas O'Bear shared archery ID developments photo. This was a picture for the promoting the meme shoot this weekend, right? Uh, he, he intentionally shared it. He clicked the share button, which is located at the bottom of each picture. And that's what showed up. But um, on, the, on this one, Martha Chavez Barnett and three other people clicked like on Dean's photo. Now, this is a beautiful photo that Dean took a couple of years ago. It's a great picture, right? Um, but say that Martha had been looking through her Facebook newsfeed and had seen something funny, but maybe inappropriate. Martha may not realize that when she clicks like or comments, everybody who is friends with her can see that. So if you happen to be liking or commenting on something that is inappropriate and by inappropriate, usually my, the good frame of reference is, would you want your grandmother to see you liking it? If the answer is no, I probably would not click like or comment because remember that your fans, your friends, your sponsors, journalists, members of the Federation are all going to see that. So you want to be very careful about the footprint that you leave behind. Okay, Twitter. I'm going to run through Twitter and I say run through because Twitter goes a little more quickly because it is literally limited to 140 characters or less. So this is a Twitter homepage. This is World Archery's Twitter homepage. And you can see here, these are the people that we are following. Very similar to Facebook, except now you're using the word follow instead of like. So we follow these people, which means that we see their tweets and uh, we have followers as well who see our tweets. When you sign up for twitter.com, and I'm gonna show you how to do that quickly, you're gonna be able to put in a profile picture, which is our logo, same principle as what we just discussed with Facebook. Um, you choose a name, which I'll show you how to do. You put in a little bit of information about yourself and especially you want to add your website and then you can choose a background for your page if you'd like to do that. So the anatomy of a tweet. This is where people get a little jammed up about Twitter. They say, oh my goodness, I just don't understand that Twitter. This is really easy. Think of Twitter as just like Facebook, just like posting on Facebook, except you are limited in the number of characters you can use and Twitter has a great 
function called trending or uh, trending topics or or searchable topics. And so when you put, so I'm going to start first of all, let's let's look at through the anatomy really quickly. Avatar means your profile picture, which I showed you here. This would for world archery that would show up. Your Twitter name is the name that you've chosen for yourself on Twitter. And your actual name that you put in to Twitter will appear next to your Twitter name. So Lance Ulanoff is all one word. That's his Twitter name. And Lance space Ulanoff is his entire name. Okay. So Lance wants to share information about the fact that it's an article. Scientists des develop world's toughest material. Here's a link to the article. Now, if you are if you want to put more information into a tweet or you just want to be really courteous to your audience, go to bit.ly and you can shorten any link that you want for free. Okay, so he's got a nice short link right here. Um, then over here, this is obviously the text of the tweet, meaning what he just typed, scientists develop world's toughest material, a hashtag, cool science, okay? A hashtag could be anything, but to give you an example, when World Archery sends out a tweet, we almost always hashtag archery so that anybody searching for archery on Twitter will find our tweet. So sometimes people use hashtags as a way to talk about a topic that's important. For example, if global warming were an important topic right now and you hashtag global warming, all one word, no spaces, um, and somebody searches global warming, you would see everybody who's been tweeting about it and you can join the conversation. So by joining the conversation, what that means, it's not a step that you take. I'm using that term sort of metaphorically. What it means is when you look at all of the tweets that Twitter lists for you, that is showing all the people who uh, tweeted about, for example, cool science, you might find that some of their tweets make sense to you and maybe you wanna follow those people. So that's a lot of how you gain followers on Twitter is you, hashtag a topic and tweet about it, put out an article about it, share a photo, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment, share an opinion, share a thought, because, but always try to hashtag what it is that you're talking about, because then more people are likely to find your tweets and follow you, just like getting fans on Facebook. So this pound sign is the hashtag, this little symbol right here. Um, what time was the tweet sent? It was sent an hour ago. You don't have to do anything with that. Um, but if you are reading this tweet, you can click to favorite it, which is similar to liking on Facebook. Okay. And all you're saying is, wow, I really loved your tweet. And the person who sent it, Lance Ulanoff, can see in his Twitter feed that, that five people favorited his tweet because they liked it. Now, retweet, which is, this is not really, these lines are not great, but retweet um, is when you like somebody's tweet so much that you want to share it. And so when you click this button, uh, Twitter will prompt you and say, uh, do you wish to retweet this? And you'll say yes. And what it does is it posts this tweet to your timeline on Twitter. So in other words, you may be, I may be Teresa Iacconi on Twitter, but this tweet will show up in my newsfeed because I thought it was interesting enough to share with everybody who follows me. And by doing that, by retweeting it, know that not only has Lance Ulanoff shared this article with his 200 followers, but because I retweeted it and maybe three or four other people did, he really extended his reach to 1,000, 10,000 or more people, depending on how many followers each person who retweeted it had. Um, and now reply means you've seen this tweet and you wanna say something back to Lance about it. You wanna say, you know what, Lance, I don't think that article is correct. I think there's an issue with that. Or, hey, man, thanks for sharing. Cool article. You can also reply, share his link, and say thanks to, and this is the one thing that's not uh, described here, you could say thanks to Lance Ulanoff for sharing this cool article. Now, what you do is you simply type the at sign, okay? So at, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, at Lance Ulanoff. So thanks at Lance Ulanoff for sharing this cool article and then the link to the article. And then the tweet comes from you instead of just retweeting what he posted. So key Twitter terms. This is a great definition. If you guys are interested in doing more research on Twitter, I recommend that you Google getting started on Twitter. There is a great guide out there from Mashable called Getting Started on Twitter that will teach you everything. A tweet is a 140 character message that you send on Twitter. Retweet is resharing or giving credit to somebody else's tweet. 
Feed is the stream of tweets, so similar to a news feed on Facebook. Your handle is your username. So Lance Ulanoff, that's the username. Um, a mention, we just mentioned that at sign, is that's how you mention somebody else. You have to put that, that at sign right before their name. So there can't be any spaces there or it doesn't link to that person. So the way that it works is if I send a tweet and let's say I, I want to tweet from my personal account and I want to at mention World Archery. So I say at World Archery, meaning I've mentioned World Archery, shared this really cool article on the Neem shoot this weekend. I post a link and I, tag, I, I hashtag archery. Well, first of all, anybody who is searching for archery will see that tweet. Um, World Archery will see that I mentioned them and they will probably retweet it. Oftentimes people do. Um, but also people who are seeing my tweet will see this mention of World Archery because of that little at sign. And now they can click World Archery's name and follow them. So it provides a link to World Archery, very similar to how you tag somebody on Facebook. A direct message is a private 140 character message between two people, but you can only direct message a user you are following who also follows you. And in general, we don't get many direct messages. Most people at that point, if it's somebody they know, would send them a text or an email. The only reason you'd really do this is if you had no other way to reach that person. And a hashtag is a way to denote a topic of conversation or participate in a larger link discussion. So signing up for Twitter, you're basically just going to visit twitter.com. Um, if you are already a member, you type in your username or email, your password, tell it to remember you or not, sign in. If you forget your password, you can click that link. If you're new to Twitter, you're going to put in your full name, email, password, and sign up. And then what I would recommend, again, it's the same thing as choosing your Facebook username. Make sure it's a, so this is your full name, which will be listed next to your username. And you want to be clear about that because people can search by your full name. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to remember that Twitter is public. People don't have to ask permission to follow you. They automatically follow you. That's the only really big difference between Twitter and Facebook is anything can, anybody can see what you're writing if you're, if you're using a standard account. Um, so you're going to put in your email address. You're going to create a password. And then you need to choose your username. Now, again, because you've got your real name in there also, if somebody searches for your real name, they'll find you. But it should be important that your username has something to do with who you are as a personality. So, for example, if you are um, Kibo Bay, you'd want to say, I, you know, Kibo Bay 2012 or something to that effect. In other words, you'd want to make it very clear to people who you are. If your name is taken, try to choose something that makes sense. You can, for example, use an underscore. You can't use dollar signs or any other symbols, but you are allowed to use an underscore and you can use numerals. But try to make it a username that is easily remembered and referenced. Tell, and it'll provide, by the way, suggestions for you here. Keep me signed in. Tailor Twitter based on my recent website visits. You can check that or not. It's If you are new to Twitter, this will allow it to this will allow Twitter to show you tweets based on where you've been browsing. You can tell it to do that or not. And then start tweeting. And so here is a, what uh, World Archery's Twitter feed looks like as viewed on an external website. Um, so you can see here, um, where's the archery action this weekend? Nemes, right? And we've hashtagged nemes because we want people to start talking about nemes and using that hashtag because we're hoping that then we can search by nemes, see all the people who are posting from nemes or sharing photos, and we can retweet them, tag them, and in general, hopefully gain more followers. And then here it is, check out our preview of Indoor World Cup. We're gonna tag World Cup all year long, action, and then here's a link to the article. Um, you can also see here, here's a, uh, we, were, we were retweeted by the Archery Time website. So Archery Time retweeted us, um, or no, we retweeted, excuse me, Archery Time tweeted at us and we retweeted them. I'm sorry, I know that sounded a little confusing. So Archery Time basically tweeted and tagged us. We saw that they tagged us. So they said, World Archery shared this beautiful photo from Dutch Target, who's one of the photographers. If you could enjoy archery anywhere, where would it be? And then there was a link to the photo here. Well, because they tagged us, I saw it 
in our timeline, Twitter sent me a little alert. And so I retweeted it so people could see that archery time is part of the archery conversation. What's your reach? Okay, so what are you getting out of Twitter? Well, World Archery has sent 3,089 tweets. We are following 102 people. We have 5,701 followers, and we are listed 127 times. Sometimes people put together um, like groups on Twitter, archery groups, uh, Olympics groups, and we're part of some of those groups. So you can see here are our analytics. Because we joined Twitter in December of 2009, but really didn't start getting active on Twitter until last summer, we are only averaging 2.72 tweets per day. If I had to average that out um, a little more accurately, managing an account like World Archery, now remember this is a, a large account with a lot of followers, I'm spending probably anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours every day between Twitter and Facebook, gathering information, finding photos, searching my newsfeed for posts to share, going online, looking for articles. It takes a little bit of time, but again, I'm managing a much larger account. To manage my personal account, I probably take 10 minutes a day between Facebook and Twitter. So again, it's a very minimal time investment for a very big return for you guys. And you can just see here some of our statistics. Um, 1,106 of our tweets have been retweeted, a total of 3,258 times. So what that means is that 1,108 tweets were retweeted, but um, other people tweeted and then retweeted and then retweeted. So this is really the more accurate number, which is 3,258, um, not views, but 3,258 3, retweets. Um, and then these are the times we retweeted others' posts which is 1,243, so we're an active part of the conversation. Um, we were hashtagged 1,166 times. Now, here's the little warning, just like with Facebook with I didn't know I shared that, there is no such thing as untweeting. So if you accidentally tweet something that is not appropriate, um, I wanna give you, this is the Archery Time Twitter account, and I wanted to use this to give you guys an example. So Archery Time on January 11th sent out a tweet. It said, uh, Bo Junkie 9 shared this photo of Dave Cousins and Bo Buff. So we tagged Dave Cousins and Chance Bo Buff practicing at Iowa Program, which is a tournament here in the States last weekend. Uh, here's a link to the picture, and then I, we hashtagged Archery. And by the way, I do their social media, which is why I'm accessing this and showing it to you. So let's say, for example, that 10 minutes after I sent that tweet, I said, you know what? probably shouldn't have said that. It's got a mistake in it. Or, ooh, I said something I shouldn't have said or tagged somebody I shouldn't have tagged or did something I just generally shouldn't have done. I want to take it back. Well, it's already been retweeted four times. And the people who retweeted it, Dave Cousins with almost 1,000 followers, USA Archery with 9,500, this guy with 30 followers, and this person with 220, right there, over 10,500 people have already seen that tweet. So potentially already seen it. So even if I delete it, it will delete. It'll delete from the people that retweeted it as well, but the damage is done because people retweeted it. So the point is you just wanna think before, before you put those 140 characters out there, because again, you are out there, you are representing World Archery, you're representing your, your federation, your sponsors, and obviously yourself and your family. So some helpful takeaways to summarize. A good social media presence will build credibility and make you the author of your own information. So important to make yourself the author of your information rather than letting somebody else create your fan page. Remember, as the sport gets more popular, we are seeing more and more and more fan pages uh, crop up. To get a good example of that, go to Facebook and search Mariana Avidia. She has, I don't know, like nine Facebook fan pages and she only ad actually administers one of them. Um, fans are going to look for images, videos, and other updates that have visual impact and give them the inside track. Fans care that you're practicing. You know, it's funny, my, um, I'm engaged to Olympian Butch Johnson, and Butch is notorious, if any of you know who he is, he is notorious for avoiding the press and avoiding social media. And I was trying to explain to him why it was important to have a fan page, and he said, Oh, nobody cares that I'm practicing. Nobody cares what kind of bow I shoot. Nobody cares what kind of string material I'm using right now or how many strands or why. 
And I had to laugh at him because that's exactly what fans care about. When Brady Ellison or Jake Kaminsky posts a video here in the U.S., I can use them as the example. They, they post a video of building strings. Jake posted a video of building strings. I can't remember how many views that video got, but it was a lot. People were interested in what kind of equipment Jake's using, what's working for him. They care that it was a tough day training. They want to see pictures of his target during practice, even if it wasn't a good end, even if he says, even an Olympian has a bad day working on my release and struggling a bit. That's great stuff. Those are the kinds of updates the fan base wants, especially from athletes. So when you're on social media, remember that you're representing yourself and your sport. And remember that once you've said it, you can never take it back. So choose your words and content carefully. Okay, so I'm going to go to the questions. And we have got a few. Hang on just one second. I'm going to close all of that out. Okay. So not in France. How many people manage the World Archery Facebook and Twitter accounts? Uh, for the most part, two. Um, I do... I do most of it. Um, I would say probably 80% to 85% usually um, I'm doing most of it. And then uh, one of our communications team members in Switzerland, uh, Vana Hay, is doing uh, some of it as well. But for, for the most part, I do the lion's share of it. Um, and then we also have uh, DDA Meville, who is our communications director, also in Switzerland, who, um, you know, kind of oversees it and, and assists with direction. Um, but as far as people actually posting, it's primarily me if you're trying to get a sense of what the time commitment is. Uh, don't forget the Arrow TV series. Very good point. Thank you, Mark. Um, we, the Arrow TV series in the United States on the CW network has been, I think, I think I heard pick, or is getting picked up for another season. It's been immensely popular. It's based on a comic book series. It's very well done uh, for the ladies. It has a very handsome uh, hero in the lead role. So it's certainly attracting a lot of popularity. Um, as a club in Sydney, Australia, I'm interested to know how to get in contact with media, media, social media. Is it best to have a page of profiles of athletes on our site or social media pages? Great question. Um, so Craig, a couple of things. Um, what I would recommend is that first, each, each athlete should have a, their own social media page that they're managing. And then what I would do is on, on your federations, or excuse me, on your, at, on your club's page, what I would do is be sure to link often to those athlete pages. Um, as far as also getting in touch with the media, which is a little bit of a separate animal, I will tell you a very good success story. Um, here in the States, we have had a lot of luck with tweeting um, at reporters. I will say that journalists look more to our Facebook to get history and see how we're interacting and get anecdotal information that they can use for a story. Um, but for for in terms of pitching a story, I would say Twitter is going to be a very easy way to do that. What I recommend, first of all, is you can find almost anybody on Twitter who's actually on there. If you search for um, any, any athlete, I mean, if you, and I'm just going to keep pulling Brady as an example, but if you go to Google and search Brady Ellison, Twitter, Brady Ellison's Twitter will come right up and you would want to, you know, follow him. Well, likewise, if you're trying to figure out who your key journalists are, I would go back to your media list, look at those key sport journalists for you, um, you know, in the Sydney area, um, or nationally find them on Twitter, Google them and find them on Twitter and follow them. And then when you have a story idea that's worth pitching, go ahead and send a tweet and tag them. Uh, we did this with Fitness Magazine here in the United States. The editor was happened to be tweeting one day and said, I think that USA Archery, and she tagged us, should send a thank you note to Suzanne Collins, author of the Hunger Games books, for making archery popular again. And I tweeted right back at her and said, we would love to. How do, how do we get started? Can we, will you publish the letter for us? And they ended up publishing our letter in Fitness Magazine. It was publicity that USA Archery wouldn't have been able to afford to buy. So that's a great way that you can use uh, social media to interact with the media. Um, would the club level be more community? Craig, would you be able to clarify a little bit uh, as you go? Um, to clarify that question just a little bit, and then I can follow up. Um, and our director of communications is saying that Olympians who have a face Facebook fan page should then make sure that you join the Olympic Facebook hub. 
Um, and we will try to get a link. I'll send a follow-up email to all of you with that link so that you can access that. Um, what do you, why do you say yes to celebrity famous person if it is a club Facebook page? Um, if your club is trying to build business, meaning that if the club is trying to do a little bit more uh, with doing, with building business, finding more people, then you'd want to say yes to uh, a bigger outreach. If you want to keep your club more private, what I would recommend doing is starting, you could start a private group on Facebook for that club. Um, but if it's a club Facebook page, I would go under, um, as opposed to celebrity famous person, do organization, team, or business for your club, because it's just going to boost your visibility and make it easier for people to interact with you by clicking like, as opposed to asking you to be their friend on Facebook. I'm just going through questions really quickly. For a club and affiliation, what would the person's name be? Uh, the, it would actually be the club name. Uh, they'll ask you for the organization name. You'll still need to fill in your person's name, your personal name, um, to to join Facebook if you haven't done that already. And what it will, what Facebook will do is it will make you the moderator or the administrator of your club's public page. So in other words, by default, Facebook creates a personal account for you when you sign up to create a club page if you're not already on Facebook. However, you don't need to do anything with your personal account. You don't need to publicize it. You don't need to get friends. You don't need to do any of those things. Can you post or tweet too often is a great question coming from uh, Douglas at Edinburgh University. Um, yes, you can overkill it. What I often tell people is how often you post and tweet depends on the reach of your audience. If you have a really large audience, what I would plan to do um, is, make, is tailor your tweets and your posts to what your audience is looking for. In other words, with World Archery, we probably post five to six items a day on Facebook, and I probably tweet or retweet close to 12 to 15 times a day because we're also retweeting and then maybe five to six original tweets. Um, but I'm also, a lot of that time investment is looking for the topics, identifying the topic, finding the photo, searching the news feed for what athletes are saying or federations are saying. Um, so I think that you're going to make it's sort of self-limiting. I mean, you you almost have to invest enough time to find good material to share. Even if you're an athlete, it's going to be as you're practicing that you're going to be sharing that information or as a club, as you're holding an event. So I would say, you know, a good a good measure is update your page at least three times a week, your Facebook, and update your Twitter at least three times to four times a week. And what I would recommend is if you can, you know, if you are much more visible on social media for a single athlete, you know, maybe two to three times a day, especially when an event is running or when you're training is probably going to be the max. I think anything more than that for an athlete or a club would say, you know, anything like 3000 followers, 2000 fans, a thousand fans, much more than that is going to be sort of spamming the group. But I think Remember that the bigger the audience, the fewer Facebook posts actually show up on everybody's newsfeed as a result of Facebook's rules. Um, so I think that you can, you know, as the following gets bigger and bigger, for example, 15,000 fans, 30,000 fans, then you can start posting a little bit more frequently to a much larger audience. Um, how do we find the recording of this webinar? Thank you, Al Wills from Canada. Um, I am recording this webinar, and as soon as it's done, I will pass it on to World Archery, and we'll determine how best to, to put the recording out there. But I will have it. If you have your, my email address, you can email me, and I'll give it to you. And um, if not, um, I'll check with World Archery about getting it hopefully online somewhere. Do you, you use tools like Hootsuite or Buffer to schedule and spread out posts throughout the day? Mark, thank you. Excellent question. I do not, I don't use Hootsuite or Buffer and I recommend not using them. And here's why. Social media professionals are really divided on this topic. I mean, it's sort of like, it's sort of almost like a political argument among social media folks. Some feel that those tools are great because they allow you to manage many clients at once. If I used a tool like Hootsuite, Yes, as a social media consultant, it would make me more productive because I could basically schedule topics to go out. Um, I could schedule them at different times of day. 
I could probably do a little bit more volume. Um, but what happens is we're in a constantly changing world and we don't necessarily always know what's going to happen before it happens. So for example, if World Archery was scheduling a tweet about the athlete of the week, whoever that person is, and some terrible tragedy occurred in archery that we didn't know about until a day later where something had happened to that athlete or that athlete had uh, you know, received an allegation that goes against clean sport rules or something terrible like that, some negative circumstance or about we post something about a federation and we don't know that there's a controversy going on in that federation. By the time that scheduled tweet has come out, it may have come out at a time when then we look like we've been inappropriate. And so many social media professionals, and I agree with them, take a more hands-on approach to Twitter. Does it take a little bit more time and forethought? Yes, it does. Are you going to be, from a, from a client management perspective, are you going to be a little less productive for the hours of the day that you're sleeping? Yes. Um, but I, as most people know, I, my work habits are a little bit crazy. Um, I start my day pretty early in the morning, East Coast time, and I, I check back in as late as 11, 11.30 at night, East Coast time. Um, so other than you know the very wee hours of the morning when some of our constituents in Asia and Europe are already awake, for the most part, uh, I'm tweeting almost around the clock. Um, and that goes for weekends as well. I think social media is kind of for, in order to give a very authentic experience to the end user, I think doing it through Hootsuite, I wouldn't really recommend it. I don't love it. I think it's got too much potential for a PR problem. And we've seen, there are a lot of examples of that out there. If you Google Hootsuite, uh, you know, social media issues, you will find uh, some pretty famous examples of problems using Hootsuite. The other thing is using a tool like Hootsuite makes it easy to mix up multiple accounts. And that's one thing I would like to counsel everybody on. If you have a personal uh, Twitter or Facebook, and then you have a work Twitter or Facebook, and you may have like a fan, you know, an athlete fan page or club fan page that you're managing, um, it makes it very, tools like that make it a little bit easier to mix those accounts up and potentially send something from the wrong account that could be construed as inappropriate. Um, we had a great example during our uh, the, president, the presidential election in the US this past year, during one of the presidential debates, uh, the company KitchenAid, which makes uh, kitchen appliances, the person using that Twitter account who is responsible for it accidentally sent a tweet that was meant to go from their personal account through the KitchenAid account. And the story was that they had used one of those tools and it had <clears throat> somehow made it very easy to mix up the two, the two accounts. And they sent a tweet that had a joke that was very disrespectful to one of the candidates and that person lost their job the next day. So I think anything that leaves room for error, even if it is sort of a shortcut and makes you a little more productive, I don't know that it's worth the potential for a long-term error. Um, okay. And the person's name was about Twitter. Okay. Thank you, Craig. So with the question was, why would you use a person's name rather than a club name on Twitter? No, absolutely not. You should use the club name on Twitter um, or the federation name on Twitter. So for example, USA Archery says USA Archery. So even though it may say name on the Twitter, you can, the, the name that you choose would be the name of the club or the organization, the Twitter name. Now, where it says personal name, meaning first name, last name, what I have done when I've established accounts for clients is I have actually used um, the words of the club name as first name, last name. So for example, if your club is called um, Excalibur Archery Club, you can put Excalibur as the first name, uh, Archery Club as the last name, or something to that effect. Or you can do Excalibur Archery or Archery Club. You just basically need to turn it into a two-word name. Um, in regards to starting the setup page of Facebook, is there a difference between business and community choices? Yes. Essentially, that's if it's a commercial entity versus a, um, versus a nonprofit group or a community group. I'm an archer and owner on the website of a website on archery in Brazil. Good. Uh, the fans next to their Facebook page uh, after I launched it, sure. Started publishing things about archery. Okay. So it sounds like, so, and I apologize if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Delio from Brazil is asking a question regarding competition, um, on social media. And it sounds like it may be, 
competition for oh, repeating photos, repeating posts, how do we avoid this? That's a great question. Uh, we're seeing that a lot in the US right now with a lot of the new websites that are cropping up around archery. And by the way, thank you for everybody who's posting these questions. For those who want to drop off, you're welcome to do so. But for those who want to hear this discussion, please stay on. I'm going to continue answering them as long as I receive them. Um, I'm free for the next little bit. Um, so how do we avoid that kind of competition? Well, as I said, we're starting to see this a lot in the United States. We have a lot of archery because the sport's becoming so popular. We have a lot of different archery websites and community groups that are starting to pop up. And there is going to be duplication of content. I don't think there's any way to help that. But what, what I always try to do in my practice in terms of social media is get the inside track somewhere. So for example, um, when I have a good work, I always try to maintain very good working relationships and, and do a lot of networking within the archery communities that I'm part of so that when I see something that looks like it's appropriate for sharing, like I really mine my personal news feed, for example, for things to share on Facebook. My Facebook is sort of a personal slash professional Facebook. And I say that because I have family members and cousins and friends and people like that on my Facebook. But then I mostly have archery people on my Facebook. Um, I have something like 925 friends, and I promise you, I don't know 925 people. Most of those people are archers who have friended me, and I'm so grateful for their friendship on Facebook. Because what I do is I look through my newsfeed every single day to try to find uh, those pieces of information that might be interesting to share, and particularly pieces of information that other people may not have. Um, I am not afraid to leverage my relationships with athletes, local clubs, and other folks to ask for question, for um, photos to share. It's, it's literally sort of a very personal effort because it's not unusual for me to call or email people and say, hey, you know, USA Archer is getting a little bit low on social media material. Um, can you help us out with some different things to share? I also look to different audiences. For example, I will go on Twitter every day and search archery just to see what the conversation is on the sport and who's talking about archery and whose posts can, can, are appropriate for sharing. So if you can imagine, I'm managing USA Archery's Twitter and Facebook, World Archery's Twitter and Facebook. Right there, those two alone, there's a lot of overlap or could be a lot of overlap. But what I do is try to time the post differently. So for example, if Brady Ellison post a great photo from practice. Well, I know World Archery is going to want to share that too. But what I might do is on this day, I might share it first from USA Archery and then wait until the evening, maybe 12 hours later, and share it up to the World Archery fans so that it's not, um, it's not completely repetitive or rep repetitive within a short amount of time. Um, so I think that and then I just keep trying to find original information. I mean, Google search archery, look at the images, search archery and architecture, archery and art. There's so many archery and science and then search under Google images. There are so many cool pictures and different things that you will see. So I think my advice to you is try to get the inside track, try to establish some good relationships within the archery community that'll get you the exclusive, you have to think a little bit like a journalist and get the exclusive on some of those pictures. And for some of those more public updates, share them, but share them at a different time. And you'll be surprised. I think the community still wants to receive them at that point. Twitter's, Twitter enables a tweet to be posted to Facebook. Is that appropriate or is that just being lazy? Thank you, Bruce Lang. That is just being lazy. Okay. Um, Vice versa. So you can either enable your Twitter to share to Facebook or your Facebook to share to Twitter, and neither is a good thing. And I know some of you are groaning when I say that and saying, oh, Teresa, that creates more work for me. But first of all, if you're sharing your post book, Facebook posts through to Twitter, remember that there's going to be some odd, uh, overlap between the two audiences, but they are by and large very different audiences. When you share a Facebook post to Twitter, the person reading it on Twitter will see half a sentence and then a link that starts with fb.me. And as soon as they see that, for most people, if you research this topic, you will see that most people report that that is something that is an annoyance on Twitter. And for many of them, they are on Twitter to avoid Facebook. You have to think of them as two different platforms, not really an extension of the same platform. And so they will not click through. They will not interact with your post and you will not get as high a level of you certainly won't get retweets because most people won't retweet anything that's linked back to Facebook. Um, and likewise, finally, most importantly, if you're talking about 
Facebook to Twitter, you're missing out on all of the functionality of Twitter with at mentions and hashtags, which do not carry over from a Facebook post to Twitter. You have to actually make that post in Twitter. Now, the other way, Twitter to Facebook, same thing. Your Facebook community doesn't care so much about hashtagging. Now, I think that, and remember too, that the tagging feature that's available to you on Facebook is not available if you post from Twitter. It's because again, they're not the same platform. Also, I think it's the same thing. The Facebook community wants to see Facebook posting and the Twitter community wants to see tweets. And so if you're kind of trying to compromise by doing a half-baked job of a little bit of both, I think you're not going to get a great response from either audience. And you're not going to get, if you look at tweets that are shared to Facebook, they don't have traditionally as high a level of interactivity or virality, meaning being shared a lot as the Twitter tweets that, are, that originate from Twitter. Sleep is for the week. It's 3 a.m. here. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. For the French Feder Archery Federation, what about FFT? Okay, so it's basically what they're saying is FFT or la Arc uh, name on Twitter and Facebook. I love that name. And frankly, it's, it's very distinctive. Jean-Denise is asking this on behalf of the French Federation. I think it's distinctive, and I think you guys have built up good brand recognition under that. My only question to you is the, the FF part. Now, the, the Tierra la Arc, I think most people universally know it means archery. Um, I assume, you know, it means like if, if I'm translating and I apologize that I don't have French, I realize that makes me sort of an ignorant person, but I know if I translate literally, it means, uh, French Federation for archery. Um, if I think the FF part is the only thing that worries me a little bit about that because people may not know to look for FF. They may be thinking, you know, Federation, you know, all of the words spelled out as opposed to FF. So I, but at the same time, I think that you guys have really surpassed several thousand members. I know, or, or excuse me, followers and fans. I know that you guys, your percentage of membership is very high compared to your number of followers and fans, but I think your followers and fans are growing very quickly. And I think you have the potential to make really large gains there. So I would say because you're very established, I would leave it as is because I think people also see your logo and they can identify you that way. But I think it's a rather long federation name and I don't think there's any easy way around that. Is it a good idea to link Facebook and Twitter? So Douglas, hopefully we just addressed that. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, thanks for the answers. I will catch up and send some questions in the future. Yes, if anybody has questions in the future, um, all of you should have from the invitation that you got to the webinar um, that came through GoToWebinar, you have my email address in there. It's, it's TeresaIaconi at gmail.com, but again, it's spelled out in that email. Please feel free to send your emails to me and ask them. You can also send them to me through Facebook, or you can send them to me through World Archery's Facebook. Um, either way is fine. You'll reach me either way. Um, has there been a copyright problem in sharing images? That is a great question. What I always try to do when we share images is give credit to the person who took the image. Um, I have not yet run into a copyright issue, but again, that's because I always try to credit the photographer. Um, if I cannot if I don't know who the photographer was, or if it looks like it's a questionable image. Now this one very important note, if you're from a federation, especially or a club, sharing photos that contain images of children, minor children. So for example, you're at your club and you've got 10 kids shooting. What are the law? I know the law is different in every country. In the United States, it's considered a safe sport practice and a best practice um, not to share images of minor children without a parent's permission, without you know one of the parents' permission. So what we will do here, for example, you'll see that USA Archery shares a lot of photos of youth archery, but what we always do is contact the parent or if the coach shares the photo with us, we ask them if the parent has given permission or to put us in touch with the parent before we share a photo of a kid. That being said, in terms of more artistic pictures, pictures taken at events, here's a general rule. USA Archery has every competitor sign a release and every photographer accept a media policy which says that if you take a picture at a USA Archery event, the athlete can, whose image is contained in the picture, their image may be used to promote archery, and the photographer 
whose photo has, who's the photographer who has been given a credential at our event, USA Archery retains the right to share their photos and their videos. Um, many other events, that's standard practice. If it's a club event, what I would almost recommend doing is, um, is thinking about um, sharing, you know, some sort of release form with either your photographers or, you know, if you're a federation, start making use of those release forms so that you have rights to those images. And finally, if it's just something you've seen on the internet, it's really cool, you just wanna share it, I would say give, and you really have no way of knowing where that image is sourced from, at least say thank you to and tag, for example, Barebow Archery is a great page on Facebook that shares lots of interesting photos. I will say thank you to Barebow Archery and I'll tag them for sharing this neat photo we're not sure who took it, but it's a beautiful image. So try to credit the photographer when you can. Um, if you can't, try to, sh to credit the person who shared the image originally, but by all means, if it comes to a photo that contains images of kids, and it's not one that's clearly been widely distributed all over the internet, if it's something that you're taking from your event or your one of your clubs, just please make sure that you have appropriate permissions to share that photo. Uh, thank you, John Denise, for that. Uh, Federation, Federation Francaise is what FF stands for. And so I think, yes, leave it as FF. And thank you very much to Jean who wrote, good initiative, let's have more webinars in the future on different topics. I love that idea. Everybody, thank you so much for all of your questions, your answers, your participation. I hope you all enjoyed this. Um, again, reach out to me if you have any questions and have a great day.